The Lemurians primarily existed in the time between the Hyperborean and Atlantean epoch. Based on the writings of William Scott Elliot, the timeline of the Lemurian race's existence is difficult to calculate with exactitude, though it probably began anywhere from 6 to 30 million years ago, and ended anywhere from 1 to 2 million years ago. It is far from a perfect time. While the race started in a near utopia, Mistakes were made on both the parts of the Lemurians, as well as those overseeing the development of this root race. One description of Lemurian physique is as follows. Their skin was very dark, being of a yellowish-brown, almost golden color. They had a long lower jaw, a strangely flattened face, small eyes but piercing, and set curiously far apart so that they could see sideways as well as in front, while the eye at the back of the head on which part of the head had no hair, enabled them to see in that direction also. They had no forehead, but there seemed to be a roll of flesh where it should have been. The head sloped backwards and upwards in a rather curious way. The arms and legs, especially the former, were longer in proportion than ours and could not be perfectly straightened either at elbows or knees. The hands and feet were enormous, and the heels projected backwards in an ungainly way. We don't need to wonder what the Lemurians looked like, though, for there are remnants of their civilization in certain select parts of the Earth. The statues on Easter Isle are sculptures of Lemurians. Whether the Earth kept these statues safe, or if they were protected for future generations by outside entities, is up for debate. Early Lemurians stood around 60 feet tall, though their height gradually decreased across the ages and later Lemurians stood between 12 and 15 feet tall. The average Lemurian lived to be over a thousand years old. In their original state, Lemurians had such well-developed capacities that their eyes could distinguish more than one and a half million tonalities of color. In modern humanity, some people are plagued with color blindness and have difficulty seeing even the seven basic distinctions of the solar prism. The Lemurians also had a third eye on the back of their head, as previously mentioned, that was fully clairvoyant, that allowed them to communicate telepathically. This eye later atrophied, and became the pineal gland for later generations. With the atrophy of that third eye, the need for vocal communication became a necessity, and one of the goals of the Lemurian race was to develop the creative powers of sound, although for a time in the race's history, they had both telepathic and vocal communication. The continent of Lemuria stretched from modern-day Africa and covered Australia, as well as the southern tip of modern South America stretching well into the Pacific Ocean, and covers the area where modern-day Easter Island is located. Initially, Lemurian people were hermaphroditic, meaning they contained complete male and female reproductive organs within their bodies. The Lemurians of the first three subraces could reproduce on their own, and when they did, they would lay eggs that had to be incubated for a period of time. Later subraces, starting with the fourth, would eventually reproduce as we do today, with two sexes requiring cooperation in order to engender a child. At some point in the Lemurian timeline, between the third and fourth subraces, estimated by Valerie Bonwick, to be somewhere around 16 and a half million years ago, the hermaphroditic Lemurians laid eggs that contained children that were beginning to have set genders, and reproduction for these Lemurians continued on to be like our own. The physical differences between the sexes was not initially obvious, and their external appearance remained the same for quite some time. Gradually, internal physical adjustments established themselves, male and female energetic qualities of expression became more pronounced. The transformation which resulted in the division of the sexes could not and did not happen overnight. It was such a gradual process that it came to be looked upon the Lemurians as unremarkable. Lemurian speech patterns developed gracefully, with an infinite variety of inflection, but it was not until the latter days of the Lemurian Empire that the written word became common in everyday use. By that time, writing had also achieved higher artistic merit, and because it attempted to express their complex musical speech patterns and scripts, the written word was also complex and inclined to pattern itself after natural plant growth. 
like fractal branches growing forward. It was well after the division of the sexes that wearing clothes took on any importance. In the beginning, it was only those who held some position of authority in the community who adorned themselves with decoration, or covered themselves, and it was a practice which began as a visible sign of the office of leader. When they began to experiment with flax, weaving became an art form in of itself, and this also resulted in an upsurge of original design. A relaxed and measured pace of life was the norm for most Lemurians, which is probably why the race evolved so slowly. Their lives were quite untroubled until the late Lemurian age, and therefore hardship was either avoidable or kept to the minimum. Lemurians had no need of complex structures for their everyday requirements, but they did become deeply involved in the creation of impressive public buildings. They had already to some extent mastered climate control, even if it was very local and on a small scale, so they needed little protection from the elements. Therefore, they chose to erect superb monumental structures that were instrumental in establishing a sense of security, furthering social interaction, promoting group affiliation, and providing a defined sense of community. Lemurians had already learned to harness telekinetic power, and their use of it in construction was supported by direction and guidance they received from their rulers. Their priest kings possessed extremely sophisticated planning abilities, as they were likely taught by extraterrestrial entities, or were extraterrestrials themselves. Lemurians were quick to emulate the massive architecture of their likely extraterrestrial mentors. Late Lemurian temples in particular became even more cyclopean in size. Flying ships and powered watercraft became very much a part of everyday Lemuria. Unlike the craft of extraterrestrials, they were simple in design and were used purely for pleasure and not intended to transport heavy weights, although they did come into permanent use as a means of frequent visits between the colonies in the later days of the Lemurian Empire. Travel on water had always seemed natural to the Lemurians, perhaps as a throwback to earlier stages of being when it was impossible for people to drown. It was not until the sinking of the continent of Atlantis and the submergence of the remaining large islands much later that mankind registered a fear of drowning. Problems for the Lemurian race began primarily due to oversights on the part of the higher intelligences overseeing the development of the Lemurian root race. These occurred just prior to the division of the sexes. The first error occurred when the comet Condor collided with the Earth, completely destabilizing the Earth's geological layers. Powerful earthquakes and tsunamis raged across the surface of the Earth, which threatened to destroy the Lemurian race. Around the same time, the beings of Lemuria were becoming increasingly worried about the reason for their existence. They were a highly perceptive race, with insights into other dimensions and they could see that their race had no potential for spiritual advancement in its current condition, due to the hindrances created by invading priest kings. In short, their existence at that time served no purpose other than to be stewards of the earth and later die. This depressed the Lemurian people and brought them on the verge of a mass suicide. In order to fix these problems, the beings in oversight of the Lemurian epic implanted an organ into the base of the Lemurian spines. This organ is known as the Kunda Buffer. The Kunda Buffer organ served three functions. The first was to stop the Lemurian race from committing mass suicide. It created in them an intense fascination with the material world, with sensations. Everything they received from taste, touch, sound, sight, and smell became more pleasurable. This preoccupied them so that they enjoyed existence and were no longer depressed by a lack of purpose. The organ's second function had to do with the stabilization of the Earth's core. The energy produced by the Kunderbuffer organ within all members of the Lemurian race was capable of neutralizing the intense earthquakes caused by the comet impact. The third function of the Kunderbuffer organ is related to the first. Once the Kunderbuffer organ is removed, it allows for spiritual development, although spiritual development can be both positive and negative. Those overseeing the Lemurian race made another miscalculation, however, and left the organ in for too long while attempting to restabilize the surface of the planet. This caused the Lemurians to become too attached to the material world. The organ was removed, but its after effects remained. <laughs>
the coccyx, or tailbone, of modern humanity is a remnant of the Cundibuffer organ, which has given the later Lemurians, as well as the Atlanteans and the modern root race, a propensity to obsess over physical stimulation and material possessions. The shadow of this organ has also led these races towards the propensity for ritual magic. The Lemurian's goal of using vocal power for creative purposes was realized in the form of mantra yoga, and some of these vocalization techniques have been passed down in various religions of the modern era. The Lemurians could also tame animals with vocalizations. Some of this reaches the modern era in rudimentary form through snake charmers and other practitioners which use music to produce various effects. At the height of their proficiency, the Lemurians could manipulate various species of the animal kingdom and control the winds and waves of the ocean. Certain leaders, who had mastered the practice of mantra yoga, developed the technique of conserving and accumulating energy, which is produced by charging the atmosphere with sound, vibration, echo, and reverberation. A technique now lost, it was a system which intensified the projection of sound waves based upon the concentration of specific harmonic patterns. The technique was originally used to harness energy for the furtherance of community projects. Energy was generated, converted, accumulated, and transferred for storage to natural caverns underneath temples until it was needed. They had given a great deal of thought to the problem of storing this energy, because they were unsure of its properties or stability. Some of the coral experiments reached heightened intensity that demanded the results remain within thickly insulated walls, rather than have its impact unintentionally influence or shatter the diverse form of non-participants. The practitioners of these mysteries who generated and served as conductors of these energies were protected by harmful effects by various means, including a self-induced trance-like state. For better or worse, ritualism and superstition had made inroads into their culture. Some later Lemurians began using vocalization to harm their fellow Lemurians. As their practices began to tend towards ritual magic, later Lemurians became competitive. While this was initially harmless and led the Lemurians to a greater degree of honest work in an otherwise calm society, it later resulted in an intense effort to control one's fellow person. This effort to acquire power was spearheaded by the leaders of less important but more pretentious family clans, their scions, or sometimes ambitious relatives, who had received some training in the ritual arts. They forgot that in order to rule successfully after gaining power, one must maintain a balance of control by imposing requisite and voluntary limitation upon one's personal ambitions. The power skills they employed included a form of mantric practice, which endowed the practitioner with some control over the elements. A few skilled practitioners bonded nature spirits to themselves, as well as members of the animal kingdom. These powers had not been used harmfully in the past, when directed sparingly or unselfishly. They were used positively for the protection of one's animal friends from the elements, by deflecting the wrath of a storm, or invoking elemental allies to help members of the community. This involved only positive thought, and nothing that was counter to the integrity or against the will of those involved. The practice of using these skills to outdo or outwit one's peers soon acquired an ugly character. The prize they sought was not a trophy or personal honor, but to acquire ascendancy over their neighbors, control those who disagreed with them, or enslave some of those whom they envied. The foundation of several hypnotic techniques owes something of their inception to this dark period in Lemurian history. The great magician initiates at this time established a branch of the hierarchy for those purely earth-born to provide training related to solving humankind's problems. Well-tested Lemurians were encouraged to train for entrance into that lodge, although it would be quite some time before they would advance to fill positions of authority held by the Great Initiates. Those Great Initiates also founded the first schools of enlightenment, to which all who proved worthy were welcomed. Later on, young Lemurians whose level of spiritual understanding had degenerated, became tempted by illusory promises of power which surely originated from their own imagination. When they applied and failed to meet the spiritual criteria required for acceptance into the Brotherhood, the spiritual rift deepened. 
many teachers left Lemuria at this time to establish centers of peer learning elsewhere based upon spiritual integrity. The atmosphere created by the practices of the ego-driven ritual magicians was suffocating. They influenced the greedy segment of the populace to oppose supporters of the spiritual lodge's brotherhood. The emigration of the spiritual magicians and their families was not a form of surrender or escape. They mounted a positive movement in the latter days to block further deterioration of Lemurian values and character by creating their own force field of energies as a barrier against the projection of the ego-driven side of magic. Until that time, the majority of Lemurians had presented a solid defense by blocking offensive negativity, but the drain upon their vitality and the constant anxiety of maintaining a defensive attitude was one of which prevented anyone from making positive progress in any other field of endeavor. They were harassed day after day by marauding animal and insect life manipulated by adepts of the left-handed path, against which one needed a constant vigilance. They fought constant battle against blight on the crops, introduced by the Brothers of the Shadow who enslaved and controlled nature spirits. They lived in constant threat from the elements. Their loved ones could literally be struck by lightning if they relaxed their protective skills, and the oceans would be whipped into a frenzy within minutes, sweeping them away if they were not encompassed by a protective shield when venturing out on the water. As with all root races, the Lemurian era eventually came to a close. Once the race's time was up, great volcanic eruptions and earthquakes overtook the continents of Lemuria and its surrounding islands. The vast majority met their end by fire, or by suffocation. It is suggested that some survivors of the Lemurian root race intermarried with the first subrace of the Atlanteans. The esoteric name of Lemuria as a global kingdom is Shalmali. This concludes part 2 of 4, and in part 3 we'll go over the fourth root race, the Atlanteans. <laughs>